I would like to welcome from the White House, Dr. Uzo Okoro, and she will be presenting for us next. Thank you. Good morning, y'all. Um, I hope you can uh, hear me. All right, thank you for that uh, warm introduction. I am Ezene, uh, Ezene Rhymes with Resume, if we haven't met, uh, and I am um, the Assistant Director for Space Policy at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. And, you know, our office, uh, our mission is to maximize the benefits of science and technology to advance health, prosperity, security, environmental quality, and justice for all Americans. And the Office of Science and Technology Policy uh, focuses on three things. The first thing we do is we provide the president and others within the executive office of the president with advice on scientific engineering and technological issues. The second thing we do is we lead the interagency on science and technology policy coordination efforts. And the third thing we do is we serve as a source of scientific and technological analysis and judgment for the president. With respect to major policies, plans, and programs uh, within the federal government, of course. Now, our portfolio is varied, um, as does mine. Mine is typically focused on civil and commercial space, topics like space weather, microgravity, uh, Earth observations, orbital debris, uh, aeronautics. Today, I will be talking to you about in-space servicing assembly and manufacturing, but I will build on what I talked about last year, where um, we will just uh, focus on what happens now uh, that we released a strategic um, vision. We released a national strategy for in-space servicing it, assembly and manufacturing. We expanded uh, what was uh, typically called on-orbit assembly to in-space, uh, uh, on-orbit servicing uh, assembly and manufacturing to in-space servicing assembly and manufacturing. And the reason for that is something that I hope that this audience um, appreciates because um, we realize that while this is a very exciting time and there are lots of uh, technologies being developed um, for on-orbit servicing and on-orbit manufacturing and on-orbit um, assembly, they are also very relevant for um, work that we will do on surfaces. Uh, this includes uh, the lunar surface, which, uh, as you know very well, will lead to uh, efforts that will uh, be conducted on Mars. And um, lots of the services that will be conducted in um, basically any orbit, because we are orbit agnostic, will also be beneficial for work that will eventually be done on Mars. So that's one of the, the, one of the goals or motivations behind expanding all of our capabilities and uh, technologies for servicing assembly and manufacturing to include you know, the exploration of Mars so that we have a multi-purpose, um, just a multi-purpose um, frame of mind as we're thinking about these uh, capabilities and technologies that companies are developing. So the, the, uh, to recap, the national strategy for in-space servicing assembly and manufacturing allowed us to start to develop policies to solve challenges and enable space commerce. And um, we know that sustained leadership in space is, cri is critical as an adoption of new capabilities. And we learned that there were three things that we needed to uh, overcome, three challenges in order to realize the benefits of these capabilities in space. So for on-orbit use, for uh, surface use, and for planetary use. The first is improving coordination and collaboration within the U.S. government um, and amongst uh, academia, amongst industry partners, and international partners as well. The second thing we learned was uh, that we needed, the government needed to send a clear and consistent demand signal to the private sector so that it could stimulate investment, help to mitigate risks, and also address investor confidence. And uh, we need all the support uh, that the sector can get for um, technologies and capabilities that will be used on Mars. The third thing we learned is that we needed to establish and adopt uh, in-space servicing assembly and manufacturing, what we call ISAM standards, 
to help promote um, growth. And so, you know, we our, our six strategies that we developed uh, helps to cut across these multiple outcomes, um, human exploration, uh, lunar capabilities on the surface of the moon, which obviously leads to future exploration of Mars. And it helps to empower U.S. entities with varying interests, um, as I mentioned, to develop these multi-purpose technologies that will really enable a new space economy um, here on this planet for the benefit of exploration on the moon and on Mars. And we know that we need um, a coordinated and robust roadmap for how to integrate current capabilities and future uh, and commercial capabilities to address the needs in, um, in about seven to eight years. And seven to eight years is because um, we see a shift happening with all the developments uh, going on in the private sector. Uh, numerous servicing and um, servicing and manufacturing capabilities and technologies, things like commoditized autonomy, things like refueling, tugs, um, additive manufacturing. You know, we are now asking a series of questions about how the U.S. government can help accelerate this um, exploration of surfaces, um, which includes the exploration of Mars. So, what are the kind of questions we're asking? Um, examples are. You know, which is the capabilities um, within the realm of in-space manufacturing and in-space servicing should be implemented within the next five years for the customers? Um, which of these technologies and capabilities are most relevant for NASA, for the Air Force, for the Space Force, for NRO? And what should we prioritize in upcoming budget cycles? You know, as we consider how to create a demand signal, what model should the U.S. government apply to the procurement of um, its procurement of commercial um, ISAM services? How do we accelerate the commercial sector's uh, technological innovation to continue to grow the economy? And are some of these tasks for the Department of Commerce alone or NASA and others how do we prioritize exploration of, um, of Mars today and uh, the technologies and capabilities that are needed? Um, in addition to what I've said a few times already, which is, you know, what we, what we um, develop for the moon will, uh, benefit, will uh, be of benefit to um, the exploration of Mars. And, you know, we also prioritize restoring America's global leadership in this administration. So how do we cooperate uh, more fully or even better with allied nations and partners? These are the kinds of questions that um, we are seeking to answer as we develop this in-space servicing assembly manufacturing plan, execute on the policy that we cre um, released last uh, April and um, enable a bigger space economy. Um, just to go over the six strat uh, strategic goals that uh, we included in our vision uh, to jog your memory, they are advancing ISAM research and development. The second is prioritizing the expansion of scalable infrastructure. The third is accelerating the emerging uh, ISAM commercial industry. The fourth is promoting international cooperation and cooperation to achieve these goals. The fifth is prioritizing environmental sustainability as we move forward with these ISAM capabilities and the six is inspiring a diverse future workforce as a potential outcome of all of the innovations that uh, we uh, intend to see. So this implementation plan that will implement these six goals uh, that I just rattled off will, will really help to um, create jobs in robotics and software and cloud networks, ground-based communications, additive manufacturing, space uh, craft component uh, development companies. We are looking to ensure that these uh, multi-purpose technologies um, help move us further um, and reduce the redundancy um, in our civil space programs and increase the um, 
a greater use of uh, commercial capabilities as we look towards the exploration of Mars. Uh, it will focus, the plan will focus on actionable steps for working towards um, fostering these uh, capabilities and technologies. And um, you, you may have already heard and uh, we'll see uh, some changes in some of our civil agencies already as they begin to implement some of the ideas and concepts that we um, are coming up with as we answer those questions. Um, I am very uh, much uh, excited about our future, the future of in-space um, serving assembly and manufacturing technologies and how the commercial sector will work with our government to make advances in, in this uh, space manufacturing, space servicing culture across the entire um, space enterprise by supporting the standardization and adoption of interfaces um, in, in all of our space systems. This is very important for our um, travels and exploration of Mars and beyond. And um, I'm really excited about our resolve to build, to continue to innovate and to manufacture a future in space and on future planets. Thank you very much for your attention. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, yeah, I just wanted to comment that, that your idea of building Earth civilization and diversity is very important and is enhanced by our going out into space and seeing the Earth as just one thing. Just wanted to make that comment. Uh, thank you very much. Doctor, could you comment on if these standards had been in place when we put the ISS up? Would that have accelerated the ISS development? How, how will creating these standards make things go faster? You know, I would rephrase your question for the future, uh, but I'll start by answering it in its current form. I don't know that we can really know everything that we could have done um, better at the time, but I do agree with your general um, hypothesis there, which is that if we did have, and we do have some um, standardization of, um, of um, technologies and interfaces, uh, we currently do. That's how companies, you know, dock onto the International Space Station. If we had more, would we have been, um, would we have created a, a more thriving sector? I think that there's a confluence of things that have led to the growth of um, space technologies um, writ large today. I mean, reusable rockets were not available um, to us in the way it is now uh, when the ISS was being built. The uh, you know launch costs continue to to drop, and uh, that's because of the incremental um, advancements being made by the commercial sector. It's by the um, I think NASA deserves a lot of credit for um, the the crew commercial crew programs and some of the contractual vehicles and space act agreements that they've had in place to really accelerate the developments that's happened that has happened in the commercial sector over the last 20 years. So I, we given that we didn't have that in addition to having um, increased standardization and uh, adoption of greater interfaces across our space systems, I don't know that that alone would have changed um, very much. But today, with everything, we really are at um, a critical juncture in history. You mentioned about sustainable technologies. What are those technologies and how will they benefit the American people? It's a great question. You know, this administration released a United States space priorities framework on December 1st of 2021. The vice president released it at the inaugural Space Council meeting. And it had two two main themes. The first themes were our space policies and the second theme was um, how space should benefit humanity. And one of those top, one of the topics under that section was on uh, sustainability. How do we um, uh, mention, uh, just give you an example of that uh, orbital debris, for instance, how are we mitigating um, 
debris, which is how we prevent it before launch? How are we tracking and characterizing debris when it's already there? And how are we remediating debris? So remediation of debris or repurposing it or recycling it, however you want to think about it, is a, an example of one of these uh, in-space servicing and manufacturing capabilities and technologies. We are actively looking at um, how the U.S. government can play a role in accelerating the growing sector that, of active debris removal and how we can support companies and how we can support our mission concepts around um, making space uh, safer and more sustainable by um, reducing the amount of debris in space. Um, so you might be thinking, well, okay, you've answered the space thing, but how does it really benefit us here? Well, it does because if space is is um, safer and more sustainable and there's less um, debris, then all our technologies that are in space that are used for the application for applications here on Earth, you know, precipitation is an easy example, weather prediction, crop yield uh, prediction uh, will be better. But more importantly, I mean, we also had um, recently in the last uh, three weeks, uh, a NASA mission that um, deflected, so we directed an, ast an asteroid and uh, from coming towards us. So debris is not in the same category as um, an asteroid that's not man-made. Um, but debris does fall onto our planet sometimes. And so um, making, um, making technologies that help us to repurpose, remediate, and recycle debris also helps to keep us safer here so that we don't have um, debris uh, falling on to our planet. Thank you. Last question. Uh, thank you very much. Brian Bender with Politico. I uh, was going to ask you to look in your crystal ball a little bit. Um, you all have talked a lot about the Biden administration sort of stepping up its efforts to come up with this new kind of regulatory framework. How do you encourage in orbit servicing and this sort of whole new era of technology of how you, you know, launch, recover, reduce space debris? You have any sense of like what's coming down the pike? In other words, how soon might we see? The administration promulgate new policies? Are there presidential directives coming? I know you're, you're talking with the industry a lot, trying to figure out what is the best approach, but give us some sort of timeline, if you can, on when, when we might see something. Thank you. Thanks. We actually released an orbital debris implementation plan in July of uh, this year. So we have shown um, actionable steps that agencies are taking after 11 months of coordination and convening and discussion led out of the, the EOP here, the Executive Office of the President, to um, steps that we're taking to address sustainability, space sustainability through um, orbital debris mitigation, tracking, and uh, remediation. So that's one place you can um, look at steps that agencies are already taking to do that. Um, as far as in-space servicing um, and actionable steps, uh, we are currently working on this. We have been uh, doing so since uh, the strategy was released last April, and um, we hope to wrap up those efforts in a few months. And again, when an implementation plan is released, uh, quite like the orbital debris implementation plan is released at the end of July, the budget cycle we were in, um, was the end of the 2024 budget cycle. So most of those actions that were not already implemented yet will then be, um, will then move to the 2025, uh, FY 2025 uh, budget cycle. Um, so for in-space servicing, um, in, in the coming months as we release the plan, then it will, it will uh, move to the budget, the appropriate budget cycle at the time. We already have some plans out that you can take a look at for what we're doing um, and the timelines that the agencies will be accomplishing. Them. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Rizzo, for